This winter season, you may be inspired to pick up a steam locomotive kit that you've had just sitting on the shelf for a while, or maybe you found a good deal on one recently and have been waiting to build it. Like this one here, it's a brand new in the box Bowser Old Lady 280 steam engine kit. So for this video series that I'll be starting here, I'll be going through and building this and giving you some building tips along the way for when you do your own steam locomotive kit. So here's the kit in its packaging and typical arrangement for Bowser steam engines. So you've got the boiler shell, the cylinders up here, drive wheels in there, chassis and motor in this area, and right here is the tender. So, I'll be starting with building the chassis, just the basic parts of it. And for that, you'll of course need the frame. Then there's a pilot. See, here's the one of the axles. So on this kit, it has these separate bearings, bushings that are pre-installed. Not all kits have these. Some of them just have a bare axle that fits into a maybe a metal slot, but on this one, since they're using a brass frame, which is actually kind of unusual for Bowser, only a few of their kits were like this, they provided those extra bearings so that it would put less wear on these slots here. Two of them are blind. One of them has a gear on it. And then right here, You've got a Pitman DC-71 motor. Now, not everyone knows this, but Bowser actually bought the tooling to the Pitman DC-71, I think back in the late 60s or sometime in the 70s. And they actually updated the motor for probably the last um, five or six years of production, so it had a skewed armature and they were very nice running, but of course the old classic ones like this are also excellent runners. They last forever. Also got the uh, front truck here and a tool set. Bowser is always good at providing things like this. So this one here is a riveting tool. And then they also give you usually a screw of some sort with a hex socket of the correct size to fit with the uh, hex screws. There's the valve gear, but we'll leave this for the next video side rod kit with cross heads and screws so we'll be needing that and then there's also a draw bar some other screws a few more parts and there's the bottom plate for the chassis so I don't think I'll be need well I might be needing some parts out of this package so I'll keep it too but the rest of this I'll leave in the box until later Bowser's always been good at giving detailed instruction manuals on full-size paper. On this one you get an exploded diagram of both the engine and the tender, and some photos of a finished model for reference. And up until maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, their manuals didn't really have many photos. Most of them were just um, text. Later on in production, they would switch to full images with um, Adobe PDF line art and everything. But uh, even without that, you get plenty of description for how to assemble it. So you can just uh, follow the text and tips and keep the exploded diagrams on hand for reference because they do give you really all the detail that you need in order to build one of these pretty easily. So there's all the chassis parts I'll be needing, aside from some of the screws and the side rods, of course. The first thing you'll want to do is make sure that any flash or anything else is cleaned up off of any of these die cast parts, and that can be filed off easily enough. And for something like the cylinders here, which have some rounded areas, it's very helpful to have one of these files that's flat on one side and round on the other. So for getting into this round area. You can just go in there with the round side like that.
Some of this flash can be pretty hard, so just get a good grip while you're working on it. And eventually, that stuff will come right off and you'll be left with a nice, clean working area. Just be careful not to file too much though, because anything you do in an outside area can become very visible through painting. So there's a pretty large spot right there, so just take the flat side and go at it a little at a time until that is nice and flat. Okay, so the cylinders are pretty well cleaned up now. There's just a couple little spots left for me to get. So with the file, you can usually get things pretty smooth, but uh, sometimes you might have to do some sanding and finishing later. Like right here, there's actually an imperfection in the casting where there's kind of a bubble there that didn't get filled with any metal. So in a later video, I'll show you how to um, work with little things like that. But for now, I'll just go ahead and clean up the pilot here and then get started on actually building the chassis. All right, pilot's all cleaned up. That's actually quite a difference in appearance from what it was before. Now, some of the kits like this one were actually made with some pretty old tooling, like the boiler and pilot were actually developed by Varney back in uh, sometime in the 50s. So this one was actually pretty old by the time Bowser started making it. They uh, got the tooling when Varney went out of business. Anyway, now we can actually get to building the chassis. So, let's see, this end here would be the front of it. So that attaches around the front pilot. And the cylinders will go there. Yeah. But first, let's put the wheels onto here. Now when putting the drive wheels on, the first thing you want to do is be sure of which one is insulated on each axle. On some kits, it's very obvious, like on the uh, MDC kits or roundhouse kits, one wheel will be made of plastic for the center and the other is metal. Um, on kits like the Tyco, Mantua, and Bowser's like these, and also on pin lines, the wheels will be all metal, but if you look very carefully, you can find a strip of insulation that's inserted inside of the wheel and on this kit, the grounded wheel goes on the engineer's side. So when it's uh, when the chassis is flipped over like this, instead the uh, insulated wheel will be over on this side. That just drops into the slots here. Once you've got that pressed in, rolls nice and freely. And for each axle you install, you want to put a drop of oil wherever there's any rolling surface. Then that helps it to roll even more smoothly. Continue to do the same for the rest of the drive axles. Sometimes you have to get one of those bushings or bearings into place and then kind of tap on the wheel to get the other one where you need it. Then you can press it in. Also, when you see any that are square shaped like that, you can take a flat blade screwdriver, just kind of push those into the flat position that they need. And that'll help in putting the bottom plate on later. Now this third axle isn't fitting into its slot quite as easily. So what I'll do here is just take a round file, kind of Twist that in there a little bit, cleaning things up a little. Don't want to do much, because if you get a loose fit, then that'll cause problems. Just go in there enough to make it so that it can have a better fit. There, that's much better. Now to put the bottom cover plate on. So this just fits right here. And it uses two screws to hold in place. Drop that into the hole. Screw that into place, but don't tighten it until you get the other one in right there. 
once all the screws are in, you can tighten them. All the wheels are still turning freely. So next up is installing the side rods. Now on most kits, or hopefully all kits really, these will be made from metal. Usually they'll be either um, die cast or a stamping like these made from either brass or nickel. Bowser used solid nickel to make these, which um, just helps them to stay shinier and it's a nice hard metal, so helps things to hold up and run for a long time. Now, no matter what manufacturer is making these, you almost always have to do just a bit of cleanup around them. With these stampings, there's usually a, just a slight edge along them where the uh, tooling finished the cutting. So just go over that lightly with a file to get rid of the any leftover flash. And then for the holes, get out the round file again and just twist that counterclockwise a bit so it doesn't dig into there. And only go at it lightly because you don't want to clear much out of these at all. If you clear out anything more than almost nothing, in most cases, that will throw off the quartering of the drive wheels as they're trying to turn with each other. And then you just don't get a smooth runner. And now to install the side rods, get out the hex driver, which on this one is actually just a screw, like I mentioned before. Take your hex screw of appropriate size and place it in there. Place your axle onto there, and then gently screw that into the wheel. You want to make sure you put that in perfectly straight. If you cross thread the screw, which is, which can be easy to do with these softer brass screws, and again that'll cause problems and you don't want that. And as you put each screw in, make sure that the whole thing turns freely, which this one does. Now on most of these steam engine kits, you may find that one of the holes in the side rods is larger than the other, and that's because this hole goes with one of these longer screws with the uh, spacer bushing attached to it. So you just uh, make sure those side rods are installed to the correct location, because they'll also be used with the uh, main rods and valve gear later. Those are installed with one of these longer hex screws that's threaded all the way over and tightens into place like that. Now, even making sure that all of the screws and parts of the rod turn freely, the real moment of truth is when you get that last screw in and try to turn the wheels together for the first time. They should go all the way around in both directions with absolutely no resistance. And on these well-made kits like the Bowsers, Mantuas, Tycos, you almost never have to worry about trying to do any adjustments to the rods. And this one is working perfectly smooth. So that means I can add a bit of oil to each of these and move on to the next step. So now I can install the cylinders and the pilot. The cylinders just drop right down there pilot goes here, hold those together, and then drop in the half inch long 256 screw there, and tighten it in, making sure everything stays right where it's supposed to be, and that seems to all be lined up correctly, so I'll turn that the rest of the way. And you want to make sure that those uh, um, slider, crosshead sliders are lined up right where they need to be so that there's no binding later. Sometimes with these uh, crosshead guide rods, you may find that they don't always have a perfect tight fit. They might even have some loose movement like this one. So what to do when that happens is line it up to exactly where you need. So I've got that one straight there. You can take some super glue, put 
put just a touch of that on the end of a wire. The liquid gap filling kind is really good for this. And then just touch that into the location that you need, making sure it doesn't get to anywhere that the parts might have to slide against each other. And then once the super glue is dry, that'll be holding in place much better. Next up, we'll be installing the crossheads. On this kit, they're made from cast metal. So like some of the other parts, they'll need just a little bit of filing done before they're ready to use. So just uh, carefully go over them. Fortunately, these don't need near as much as the uh, cylinders and pilot did. Just gotta take a bit of flash off. Since these are moving parts, any flash that's on there could get in the way of its movement and cause a bind. You absolutely don't want any binding. So with that cleaned up, next thing I like to do is place it into the sliders without the rod or anything. Get it into the hole there. There we go. And then that allows you to place a wire or something else in there to just kind of slide it back and forth. This one's feeling a bit stiff, so I'll have to figure out exactly what's causing that stiffness and work it out of there. Now an easy way to kind of rule out which part is causing the problem is to turn it around if possible anyway, that may not work on all kits. And then see how it moves without the um, piston rod going into the cylinder. It moves pretty freely here. Not quite perfect though, so in that case, what I'll do, let's see, can I fit the file in there? Not quite. In that case, what I'll do is take a piece of sandpaper, kind of fold the end like that, and move it back and forth inside there until things seem to be nice and clean. This is 600 grit automotive sandpaper, so it leaves a nice smooth surface. But you do want to brush out any possible sanding dust before you put it back on there. Yeah, I can move that back and forth with absolutely no effort now. Now, if cleaning out the slots doesn't work, then you can also check on the piston rod there and make sure that it's straight and going in the way that it needs to be. And if you find there's a bend in there at all, usually you can straighten it out without too much difficulty. You would just uh, grip the bent area with pliers and then work on it by hand a little at a time until it's nice and straight. So now take the cross head and one of the main rods, just kind of hold those together and get the screw with the little hex driver there. The instructions show to use one of the flat heads, but I found that they changed the screws for this part at some point and apparently didn't update it in there. Get that snug, make sure it still has free movement. And on this particular kit, it'll be a little bit sloppy because the head is made to also fit with a piece of the valve gear, which will come in the next video. So now to get that on, unscrew this one here. Wanna leave this little spacer in there though. And slide this in. Line up the main rod with that um, spacer bushing. And put the screw back in. And everything should move nice and free, which it does. Now I'll just finish that by putting a touch of oil here. Another drop here. 
and one more in here. And now with the main assembly of the chassis finished, the next thing I'll add on is the motor. Now before I put the motor on, I'll go ahead and add a little bit of oil to it just to make sure it's going to run as well as possible. These motors have usually been sitting for a long time, and older ones especially will need some oil in their bearings to make sure that they are working smoothly. And that should be enough. Now usually with kits, you can just insert the screw through the bottom of the chassis, line it right up with the motor, but because of how this one is designed with the uh, brass sheet metal construction, Instead, I'll have to start by putting the screw into the chassis without that cover plate on. There we go. And then, place the motor upside down. Line things up. And then I can get that screw started. But I'm not going to tighten it, I'm just getting it started. I'll put the plate back on. Okay, that's all in place. So now I'll tighten that screw. And let's see how the mesh is looking. Because usually you do have to adjust the mesh between the worm and the axle gear. Seems like it's pretty good right now. Actually, it might be slightly loose. It should be tight enough that you get almost no movement between the axle and the worm when you try and move the wheel, but it shouldn't be so tight that it binds. So, yeah, I'll need just a, maybe a couple washers between the back of the motor and the chassis. Once in a while you have to deal with a little manufacturing error, but fortunately something like an undersized hole is easy to correct. There we go. Now I'll place the washers in there, and then place the screw into the hole. Alright, that's going through. Sometimes the washers might want to move around a bit. There, but then they'll eventually line up. Now tighten that front screw again, making sure the gears aren't binding. I think that's about perfect. Well, one way to find out. So now that the motor's installed, I'll give it a quick test. Just to hook up the negative terminal to that wire, and the positive to the chassis. Feels nice and smooth. Yep, that seems to be just right. So now that I've got the mesh where it needs to be, I'll just power that up real quick. Get it low speed. And then let some grease work its way through. You don't want to set it to high speed, otherwise it could start flinging grease all over. And you want it to stay in the gear and spread through. You don't want to have too much in there. Now I'll run that the other way. Make sure that it's fully spread through. And 
and the chassis is now complete. So for most steam engine kits, that's really about all there is to building the basic chassis and getting it running. For the next video, I'll be doing the valve gear and just a bit more fine tuning here and there if needed.